ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وسلم اجمعين اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته كيف حالكم جميعا يا ايها الاخوه واخوا او brothers and sisters in full islam والحمد لله tonight with the law or this evening rather we will begin or late afternoon if you will we will begin inshallah ta'ala on picking back up on our chapter which is known as babul ishratun uh babul ishratun uh ma'a nisa or babul ishratun nisa and it's taken from the kitab ul nikah the book of marriage uh we're going to talk about living with one spouse and one harmonies for those who caught the earlier videos alhamdulillah there were some things that we had skipped over to get to the point we're going to talk about tonight the reason being is because in those issues the author goes into issues about the age consent in terms of when sexual relations can happen with one spouse uh due to a lot of the controversy especially us being raised in the west and us being raised over here in the west uh we are accustomed to certain things in certain uh in certain ways and even with the R Kelly thing going on like that I chose not to really talk about that particular subject but there are different cultural understandings and perspectives uh pertaining to this issue and uh everything is not the same as how the west holds it but we went over that so we're not going to really go into that particular topic inshallah ta'ala in the segment of this book um alhamdulillah we're going to cover today inshallah ta'ala um the time allotment and what i mean by time allotment basically is the right which the spouse meaning the wife has over the husband in the time that he's supposed to spend with her uh is it one night is it two nights is it three nights is it four out of the week um how is that to be distributed um we're going to talk about that in this particular seg- segment inshallah as well as we're going to talk about something known as misyar this is new to me um however uh i had experience with something similar to this but it is new to me that the ulama have actually been asked and they have addressed this issue which is known as nikah ul misyar all right so we're going to talk about what is nikah ul misyar what is some of the reasons why this nikah ul misyar have emerged why did it come about we're going to talk about some of the prominent scholars who have addressed uh this issue questions was posed to them about the ruling the hukum on the uh misyar marriage uh you know together and then we're going to talk about the final thoughts on whether or not it's permissible or not or some of the horns of uh, practicing it now misyar marriage we're going to give you the definition of that first before going into the uh, actual class we're going to give you the definition of misyar marriage now for those who don't know misyar a uh, misyar marriage or nikah or misyar as it is called it is a marriage where normally it is conducted like a regular marriage uh, a sharia uh, legislative marriage whereas though you have the ki uh, wali or guardian you have the consent and the pleasure between both of the parties meaning between the husband and the wife all right between the bride and the groom and both both have to have a rida they both have and you have the acceptance and so forth everything that's normally there for a legislative marriage is the same thing with a misyar marriage the only difference is that the woman agree to give up either some accommodation some maintenance or her husband spending the night with her in terms of some of her time as might be given up so he's not with her every other night if he have multiple wives or if you know he's not with her every night you understand she gives up or forfeits some of her rights this is a misyar marriage now why would this happen why would people feel the need to even get involved in that all right there are multiple reasons some of the prominent reasons why people would get involved in some type of marriage like this is because one we already know that there is a plethora of women plethora of women all right women outnumber men and a lot of women wants to be married and there are a lot of men I mean, a lot of women wants to be married and then there is um cases where uh men uh the the woman wants to be married and due to the high uh mahar you know what i mean because it's a little bit different well i can't say it's a lot different but it's totally kind of different here in the west when we're looking to get married uh, often times we don't have the father and the mother uh you know or the father really conducting the marriage or being a part of the marriage institute here 
you know, we have, we go into an Islamic century or we go into a masjid or we go into somebody we know, something like that, and they're selecting a wakil or, I mean, a wali in that case, I mean, a wakil in that case, they're selecting a wakil. But we don't have that. But overseas, a lot of them are tested with having their father or their brother of someone like that from their family. This is a good thing, but then it's not a good thing because then what they do is they start to auction off the woman in a way where as though they make the mahar, the money that is given from the uh, the bride, uh, offered from the groom to the bride, they make that exceedingly high. So it makes it hard for that woman to get married. Right, and it makes it difficult for the men to actually marry. So, some of the reason what they do is they find whereas though a woman will agree, uh, in the circumstances like that to come marry and fortify some of the rights that is allowed allotted to her, all right, so that she can be in that marriage. Another reason for it is the simple fact of a man wants to take on a second or a third or a fourth wife, right, and you know, uh, hum by hum, want to practice that she gives up some of those rights that she wants to accommodate because she want to make the, the issue easy for him. Another reason is being as though a woman can't leave her home. She might have to take care of one of her parents or both of her parents. She'd probably be the caregiver to, you know, or the caretaker of both of her parents or one of her parents. Or she can't leave home because she have children and she can't leave the children and relocate to another home. Or something which will prevent her from leaving out the home to actually stay with the husband. And so the husband will have to come from one place over there to do it. Please go upstairs. Right? So in that case, it will become a problem. And then what will happen is, in order for that woman to get married, she agrees to give up something of her rights so that she can be married and not being single. So she gives up some of that. So these are some of the reasons. Another reason would is um, a man might uh, conceal the fact that he takes on a second wife or a third wife uh, for fear of the consequences that he might have with his first family. And he gets involved in a situation like this. This is called a Miss Yar marriage. All right. Now, the ruling pertaining to this. So before we get to the hookum, let's go into some of the prominent scholars who were asked these questions and dealt with this issue. From the likes of them is Sheikh Mini Bas. Um, Rahmatullah Ta'ala Alayh, uh, the former Grand Mufti. Abdullah ibn Ibas, he was asked about this particular question. We're going to give you his answer pertaining to that. Uh, he was one of those scholars who said that it was permissible to do so. Um, also, um, Sheikh, Sheikh um, Abdul Aziz Ali Sheikh, he was also asked about it. His, his answer was definitely in support of it. Um, it's permissible to do so. And then they have clauses in where, why they mention it. And then you have Sheikh Rathameen who was for it at one time, but then he retracted due to some of the harm that was practiced by the people who were doing this. All right. And not fearing a lot as a wajal in regards to these misjar marriages. So he retracted his statement as he was for it that it's being permissible. Then he went against it being permissible or being allowed. All right. Um, and then you had Sheikh Alabani, Sheikh Nasruddin Alabani, who actually was against it altogether. And he had two main reasons why. So he, he said that it wasn't permissible at all. Well, he, he, it was not allowed at all. And he had his two reasons why it wasn't allowed to actually partake in this particular mystery of marriage. Anyway, I'll tell you. So, so that we know the certain things about it. All right. None of the scholars said that it is correct or incorrect in regards to the matter of the mystery of marriage if certain things are already fulfilled. If it had been conducted like a shara event uh, uh, marriage, meaning that it did have a wali, because a woman can't be married without a guardian, right? It had witnesses, okay? It had the diary, the mahar has been presented, right? The pleasure of both. It didn't have any impediments, things such as they weren't related to each other, so they couldn't marry each other. It wasn't no moana, no things that would prevent them from being married. Everything was on the up and up and, you know, so forth. Then they would mention that, you know, in this case, you know, it's either some of them would disallow it or some of them will find that it is makru, is dislike um, to do this type of marriage because of the rights and because of the effect that it might have on the woman and Sheikh Alabani argument was the effect that it might have on the children. If the man, for example, have a wife in a distant land or a distant part of the city, and he can't be with her like he normally would be with his wife, right? And she for, for, fortifies some of those things. And she have children by this man, and he can't always see him. The children can't always see him. They would grow up, and it would have a negative impact on them. That was one of the arguments that Sheikh Alabani actually spoke and used against why it's not allowed. All right? Tight. 
Sheikh Ibn Ibaz, as far as the ruling, Sheikh Ibn Ibaz was asked about the permissibility of such marriages. Uh, Sheikh Ibn Ibaz, rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, he says that if one, if it's conducted according to the Sharia, right, and we have everything in there that it's supposed to be, two, if it's announced and it's not hidden, it's not a hidden marriage. We already know that. The Prophet ﷺ made that clear. That any marriage that is done in secret, it's not really, a, you know, it's not a good marriage. It's like fornication. You understand? You shouldn't keep the marriage in secret. In other words, you should tell someone. You should relate it to someone. It should be announced that you are actually married. All right? Don't conceal that. It's different now if you're concealing it from your first wife, as we said before. That's a little bit different. I don't want to go into that conversation right now. Some of you might want to beat me up, especially a lot of you females. But anyway, that's a little different issue. But in terms of telling someone and letting people know that you're married, you have to let people know that you're married, right? Especially in terms of having witnesses due to the ayah that comes in Surah the talaq um, And that's a different issue altogether as far as when you divorce, you have to have two witnesses and also having witnesses when you get married. Tayyip, um, he continues, he says... Then it is permissible under this context be, if the woman agrees, you know, you're both pleased, she's agrees to whether see you sometimes give up some of her rights or anything like that. That's something that y'all both agree. It was carried out and conducted in a legislative manner. Y'all married, right? Because of the hadith of the Prophet, ﷺ, that which is more deserving, the rights which are more deserving to be fulfilled are those which makes what? That which is halal, right? Become permissible. In other words, meaning that which is between a aqdun nikah, a marital contract, which made the woman halal for the man. Those rights are more to be fulfilled. And also, Sheikh Ibn Ibas, he says, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enjoined upon the believers to fulfill their conditions. All right. That was the end of his answer or his fatwa pertaining to that particular issue. Sheikh uh, Du'aziz Ali Sheikh, he answers similarly. And he says, you know, and, and, and what he says is that, if all of this has been conducted, a wedding, a walima was taking place, the sharia, everything, guardians, witnesses, so forth, contract, mahar, all of that was done. He said, you can call it whatever you want to call it after that. Everything is already done. It's fulfilled. Then it's permissible. All right? Sheikh, Sheikh Rathameen, he retracted his statement once he seen that there were some people misusing the Mishyar marriage. All right? Those who come in and misuse it for wrong reasons and... And so forth, so he retracted Sheikh Alaban, as we said, he's negated. Now, overall summary before we go into the class, you might say, again, and this is why a lot of times, you know, the reason why I felt the need to bring this up because I want to talk about something in here in this book, inshallah ta'ala, that will help you understand the importance of Miss Yar marriage, right? And the reason why I say this is because a lot of times we often forget. Brother, the, the point of to add the, it's not sexual relations. I don't understand why a lot of people keep thinking that, right? A lot of people keep thinking that same way of people. How do you feel if a person say, well, okay, if you're getting married, it's all about money. You get married to that woman, it's all about money. You get married, it's all about money. It's all about money. Yes, money plays a part of the, of the marriage. It's a big part of the marriage, nafaka, right? We know that, right? Just like we know that relations plays a part of the marriage as well. But that's not the purpose of it. You're not going to say that the Prophet ﷺ was just trying to lust off of all of the women that he married. All right? Stop acting like ta'addud is a cancer. Wallahi, man. A lot of people, man, and it's crazy because it's believers behaving this way. And I don't understand it. How you're a believer and you're behaving this way as if ta'addud, anything that is legislated from Allah is good. Period. It's no it ends about it. Whether you're talking about it's for me or not for me, anything that Allah has legislated is good. That's understood. This is a solid principle that we all must understand. I'm not saying you have to jump out. It's not obligatory that you have to be in polygyny. I'm not saying that you have to. I'm not saying you have to jump out for it. We know that there are conditions for it. We know that people need to have certain things in order in order to actually conduct it. We know that. But at the same time, anything that Allah legislates, we should be pleased with it and love it. All you have to do is go back to Sheikh Muhammad Duwar Ahab book when he talks about what? The things, the, the things that which is obligatory for thee. The legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the ibad, things that they must accept. And one of the things is whenever Allah gives a ruling or things like that, we are pleased with that ruling. We are pleased with that legislation. We love it. All right? That don't mean you have to practice it, but we love it because you know it comes from the Creator. All right? That's there. Another thing is because one of the things that ta'addu does is that it affords every woman an opportunity to be married. You understand that? Every woman gets the opportunity to have a husband. That's a beautiful thing, right? You want your sister not going, in, going in, in, in this life, not having a husband, not being married, especially in the day and age, to be tempted with all of the different things that's going on. 
You want her to be out here without having any no protection and none of these different things or not having any companionship, anything in, in this world? No, you want her to actually have a husband too. You want her to have, have the opportunity of that too. So you have to understand this. It's not something, this, it's also the different ties that it brings, the different connections that it brings. A lot of different things into Edda. This is not the talk for that to go into the benefits of plural marriage, but I just want you to understand why Miss Yaro marriage became a thing. Do you understand? Why did it became a thing? Because that sister, even though, especially, the, you know, alhamdulillah, it should be understood that you should not, you should not, under no circumstances, in summary, misuse the misyar marriage. You have to understand that that woman is giving up her rights. And if she forfeits some of her rights, you should not trample upon those rights. You should not be saying, I'm going to get someone who is religi religious, uh, who are weak in their deen, who are weak in their understanding, okay? Don't go grab somebody like that that don't understand that. If it's an individual basis, this is what some of the scholars, they said that you need to look at it on the individual basis between the man and the woman who's getting involved with that. Look at their condition. See if it's fitting for them. If it's not fitting for them, they should not practice. They should stay away from it. Do you understand? It's not the same as mut'ah marriage. Okay? It's not the same as mut'ah marriage. Temporary marriage. It's not the same as that. But it still can be a form of demeaning because, if, for example, the woman is giving up some of her rights. She's fortifying some of her rights. So you have to take that in consideration. All right. Even though you're going to be a husband, but you still have to take consideration the rights that she's for the fitting. I hope I, I summarize most of the stuff I was able to give you about the mystery of marriage. Let's move on to the section that we're going to talk about. Well, the author, he says, Well, so he's talking about here in this particular issue. He's talking about that it is binding or necessary or is required upon the husband that he spends with his free wife his wife is not a slave she's a free woman he spends with his wife who is horror who is free wife one night out of every four okay one night out of every four and if he wants he can be alone for the remaining nights all right he can be alone for the remaining nights of the week okay this is what the author mentioned Shaykh what they mean lay comment on this he says the pronoun here meaning the husband it is binding on the husband he says as far as the statement here he says what it means is that it is in, is it upon him to spend one night from out of four nights with a free believing woman for you be to end the fil mother and what he mean by spend the night with her meaning that they share the same bed all right Shaykh Dibin says not that they stay in the same room and they're not in the same bed no it actually was intended is that they share the same bed okay and even more than that, you know, we're going to get into that, inshallah ta'ala, in this talk about the relations that they should have. But in the same bed, meaning they should sit in the same bed, based off the ayat of Allah, Jalla wa ala, where he says in Surah Tanisa, verse 34, Allah says, fil Allah says, and separate from them in their beds. This verse here, meaning fi faraj, is a point of reference here for this point. And we just said that. So it's not meaning that he spends he spends with her, for example, uh, he's in one room and she's in a room yeah, in the house. She's in a, another room in the house. Or in, no, rather they spend that one night together out of those four nights in the same bed. Meaning that the three nights out of the four nights is for him. Okay. Now, what they try to use is evidence. And now you got to think because we're talking about fiqh here. And this is humbly fiqh that we're discussing. What they use for evidence is a athar that comes to the woman. She came to the, uh, to the uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, who was Umar ibn al-Khattab, ta'ala anhu at that time. She came to the chief of the uh, believers, Umar ibn al-Khattab. And she came complaining about her husband. She says, indeed, my husband, he stands up in, at night praying during the night. That's what he does. He spends his night in prayer. And he spends his daytime in fasting. And then she says, Meaning, like, I don't have nothing for me out of his time. So he's, he's either either at night, he's preoccupied doing ibadah, he's worshiping to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and during the daytime, he's what? And during the daytime, he's fasting. So if you're fasting, you can't have relations. You can't even enjoy your wife at that point, right? So she's saying that he, he doesn't have no time for me. I have no portion in his time. So she came complaining to Umar ibn al-Khattab about her husband. So what did Umar says to her? He told her to, he sought forgiveness for her. And then he commanded her to be patient, right? With her husband and then she turns away. 
Now, Kaab ibn Siwar, the other campaign, I mean, or Kaab ibn Siwar, he was there. فلما صرفت قال When she turned away and left and withdraw, he says, يا أمير المؤمنين إنك ما قديت حاجاتها He says, O oh, oh, chief of the believers, he told Umar, indeed you have not fulfilled her request. You not fulfill her need. You didn't help her out in this case. Right? Because Umar didn't understand actually what she was saying. And Kaab understood what she was saying. So Umar said to him, Why, why are you saying this? Why are you saying I have not fulfilled her need? He says, Because she came complaining of her husband to you. So Umar ibn al Khattab, he sent for the husband and he informed him. Then he said to Kaab, Judge between them, meaning between the husband and the wife in this case. He told Kaab to do it. He says, Because indeed you know better their situation than I do. And this is important to understand. This is tawadir. This is humbleness from the Amir al Mu'mineen. This is Umar ibn al Khattab we're talking about. Right? And here is he telling another companion, or he telling, he telling another companion, uh, Go ahead and judge between because, and he's recognizing that he understood the issue than him. He didn't use the fact that he's Umar ibn Khattab, his station, his status, his reputation, his position. He didn't use that to overlook the fact of, you know, a person having a fadl there, a person having some more knowledge than him than this. And this is important to understand no matter what we learn, no matter what books we study, no matter what we have memorized, no matter what, um, you know, we have graduated or what levels we have reached we should always keep humbleness as a friend to us as that was reminded and advised to our prophet muhammad sallallahu from jibril alayhi salam when he told the prophet sallam, to be like a humble like prophet right not like a king like Dawood and Suleiman, but be like a humble like prophet and being humble only as the prophet sallam, says it only what raises things up i'm in class please upstairs i'm upstairs i don't know where is that upstairs I don't know where it's at. All right, so. Okay, upstairs. All right, you with me? Uh, so, in terms of that, it's, it's good to always try to be humble. Try to be humble. That's the best way to be. You don't have to be, you know, well, I've been giving Dawah 10 years, or I've been giving Dawah 20 years, and so nobody can't tell you nothing. Well, Allah, it's Allah, it's Allah. There's individuals who I meet, uh, throughout my life that has probably not studied or came across certain issues I came across but then they are well versed and other issues that I haven't even touched on or issues that I thought I may have understood but they understood and they don't consider themselves or carry themselves as saying I'm being a you know a talib or ilm or I'm this or I'm that and they and they might have more you know understanding of that issue than I have and this is something that we need to really, you know, take a look at that. So I just wanted to point that out because this is beautiful seeing the adab and etiquette from the Amir al Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, the one if he walk on one side of the shaitan or walk on the other side of the streets, right? So he says, judge between them. So what Kaab said, he says, for her, she gets one night out of the four, and then the rest is for you. He tells the husband, the rest is for you, all right? Now remember, the husband don't have, he's not in polygyny here. He only have one wife here. He's not in polygyny here. He has one wife. But why would he tell him that he only got to give her one night out of the week and not all? Okay, we're going to talk about this. And Sheikh Rathameen is going to give us some benefits in our time to how to understand this, okay? So, reason why, Sheikh Rathameen says, Because, one, it is permissible for him to marry up to four women, okay? And if he was married to four women, each of those four women will have a night, right? So, henceforth, he would have to give her one night out of that night if it was four women, right? Tight. All right, so we got that. So Umar was amazed at the wisdom and the ruling and the judgment as in complying of Kaab. He was amazed. And this is something that we've seen uh, Kaab given a ruling in the presence of Umar. And Umar confirmed this as a waqarru uh, alayhi, and him confirming this is a hujjah. Umar by his confirmation, by Umar's confirmation, because Umar is one of the rightly khulafa. And the Prophet said, What? Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnatil khulafai 
Rashidin uh, al The Prophet said upon you is my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided Khulafa. And Umar ibn Khattab is one of the rightly guided Khulafa. That's the point Sheikh Rathameen has mentioned. Some of the people of knowledge, they say that rally it is a must that he spends with her, yani, uh, he spends with her in that which is ma'roof. Because Allah says, wa'ashiruhunna bil ma'roof. Meaning according to what's custom. Jarrata bihi ahda. What is normally the norm? What's normally understood from a man and a woman when they live together? A husband and a wife that live together, how many nights do you stay with her? You see? So Shaykh Zameen is saying that some scholars say no, it's required for him that he spend that what's known. If it's customly known that he spend every night with his wife, if he don't have a, if he's not in a plural marriage, then that's what he spends. Not one night out of every four, because this is not the same case as the ruling of Ka'ab, okay? He says that وَفِي لَيْلَةٍ مَا هَدْهِ الزَّوْجَةِ فَقُولُ يَعْرِفُ أَنَّ هَدْهِ الْجَنْفِ وَلَا يَوْزِمُ مِنْ كَوْنِهِ لَا يَوْزِمُ إِلَّا لَيْلَةٍ إِذَا كَانَ عِنْدُهُ أَرْبَى نِسَاءٍ أَلَا يَوْزِمُ أَكْثَرَ إِذَا لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ إِلَّا وَاحِدًا So, and he's basically saying that because it wouldn't be binding on him except one night if he had four wives. If he had four wives, then that would be the case. He only get one night from him. Right? Because due to the necessity of what? Of being just. He had to be just between the wives in terms of his time and in terms of his nafaka, his provisions. So he have to do that, right? Okay, so he, he, he explained that. Well, أَنَا مَجَرَتُ بِهِ آدَى يَكُونَ مُقَرِبًا لِمَا قَضَى بِهِ كَعَبْ He says, what is apparent is that that which is customly, which is known as the custom, was more closer to what uh, Kaab uh, has ruled, okay? When the woman came complaining to, the, uh, to Umar ibn Khattab about her husband. He says, "Amma he says, 'Amma fil mashura wa irshad wa nus fa inhu yamba gani yushara ala zout, fa yuqa inna hadi zoutatuk wa la yamba gani anta hajarah." He says, he says, it is said, he says, as for what should be pointed out to the husband, it should be said to him that this is your wife, man, and wa la yamba gani anta hajarah, and it's not befitting that you, yeah, any boycott her, that you, you know, you abandon her. It's not befitting that you do so. Right? Because Allah Jalla wa Ali says in the Quran in the same verse that we used earlier, Wallati taqafuna nashuzahunna fa'iduhunna wahjuruhunna fil madajir. Allah Jalla wa Ali he says, and the one whom you fear nushuz, disobedience on her behalf, then admonish her, admonish them, and separate them from them in their bids. He says, Emma ma adam akofa nushuz, fala yambagi and tahjara wala leila. Shaykh Dameen says, as for if. That's not the case. She's not being disrespectful. There's no new shoes going on. And then he says, then you, you what? If you don't fear that there's the no disobedience, then it's not befitting for you that you abandon her, not even for one night. He says, إِلَّا إِذَا جَرَّ أُرْفَ Unless the customs is known for that. If it's not according to the custom, it's not there. Well, the call, he said, this opinion is huwa sawab, is the one that is correct and closer to the truth. Allahu a'lam. Allah knows best. And he says, as for the statement of the Often when he says And that he spends himself uh, alone يعني, For the remaining nights He says إِنَّ رَادَ فِي الْبَاكِ وَهُوَ ثَلَاثَ لِيَالٍ وَلَكِنْ لَوْ أَنَّ مَرَأَ أَبَا أَنْ يَبِيتَ عِنْدَهَا لَيْلَ مِنْ عَرَبَ فَلَا تَمْلِكُ هَذَا He says um, In this case all right, it, It's not up to pretty much the woman in that case In regards to the husband Having his a long time for the nights He has to give what is right And what's hard to right there All right, He says وَيَعْزُمُهُ وَالْتْ The next point he makes that it is binding upon him that he have relations according to his ability one third, <laughs> one time out of every one third portion of the year. Right? Right? Think about that. So it's, he's required to fulfill his wife's desire one third, once out of every one third portion of the year. All right? This is according to the method. Of Hanbali, all right. We're not saying that this is the actual correct position, but still, this is what the author is saying. Sheikh Taymin says, meaning, al jima la yazmu bi sanna illa thalatha marrat. He says, meaning, thulatu. Actually, one, one third, meaning three times here. He says, meaning that he had relations is not binding for him in one year except three times. Hulu thulatu sanna marrata fakat. Meaning that up into one year, it is three times in which he has relations with his wife, which is binding upon him to fulfill her desires. So, Shikha Damini says that what if the case that the woman is from the youth? She's a shaft. So her, her, her desire might be strong. 
It's different from someone who might be elderly, might be older in age. How, you know, and, 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 and so that we understand the difference here, someone being elderly doesn't mean that they're 50 years old because, again, if they're 50 years old, they're still in their four. Adulthood, elderly is after the age of 60, okay? So I don't want you to get that confused, all right? So because you have some women who are in their 40s and some women and some men who are in their 40s as well as women who are in their uh, 50s, you know, in the early 50s and so forth that are very rigorous and still have a strong desire. So don't think that that's like the same there. He says, He says, what's understood from the part when he says in Qadira, meaning if he's capable, he says what this means is that uh, if he's incapable, if he's incapable into fulfilling her desires, then it is not binding upon him to fulfill her desires. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not place a burden upon a person which he cannot bear. And there is no sin uh, on him for that. However, what remains is we need to look and see is he incapable of fulfilling her desires? Alright, we're not talking about being incapable of, for whatever reason, not fulfilling her desires at least three times out of a year. We're talking about if he can't fulfill her desires at all. Alright, so we have to look at that. If he's, un, if he's unable, if he's incapable of fulfilling her desire at all, meaning she cannot get no fulfillment from him, then in that case, what happens? What happens in that case? He says, Sahib wa wa huwa zawd. The woman, the woman has the right here. She's the Sahib wa haq. That's her haq. Having, having her desire being fulfilled from her husband in the relationship, it's her, it's, it's her haq. Just like having his desire being fulfilled in the relationship, it's his haq. All right, that's both haqs. That's they say mushtarika bayna huma. This is a haq which is shared between both husband and wife. All right, that's a haq shared between both husband and wife. It's not fear that the husband be fulfilled, and at the same time, if the question is pertaining to what the sheikh is saying or the or the class, then let best be. I have no problem with that. If the question is way over my head, I'm going to tell you I don't know. All right, type. So he goes on. He says. Uh, he says, um, he mentioned here, he says, so what happens if the case, if he is incapable of fulfilling her desires, All right? That's not a topic that I want to go into right now because you're going to have many kalams from both past and present that talks about this issue. And a lot of it is strong, especially with those who are accustomed to certain things and, and certain customs. Uh, they use evidence that might point to it but still there is nothing definitive uh and clear sarir you know that it is haram uh to engage in those particular uh customs so basically it's confined from my understanding of the mas'ala is that it's confined to what a person is accustomed to all right if a person is not accustomed to doing certain things then you shouldn't introduce certain things to them that they're not accustomed to all right there are statements from scholars that mention that even sex talk or dirty talk if you, what we call that is something that is you know can be encouraged and happen within the relationship between both the husband and, really from the husband uh, to the wife this is something that you know it's sort of like foreplay and it keeps things going with them if it's okay there's no problem with that with the wife having no problem with that then this is something that is permissible there's nothing clear that say you can't However, there are scholars who say that you should stay away from those type of things altogether. And they use different ayats, such as the ayat that comes in Surah Mu'minun, and many different ayats where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Illa ladina, uh, except with those, Illa ladina, um, aw ma, uh, Allah, Allah says, aw, aw, um, azwajihim, aw ma malakat aymanuhum. Except with those with whom, Illa ladina hafidu ala, as well, I mean, um, they guard their private parts. Set with their illa, yani as wajim, well, except their wives, or those whom their right hand possesses. Because Allah mentioned specifically either their wives is who they fulfill their desires with, and either their slaves whom they fulfill their desires with, anything outside of that will make it haram. This is some of the arguments that they use. So, also, Sheikh Alabani is reported to have said that this is the act that resembles the animals, specifically the dog. All right? So, um, like I said, different cultures, different things. It's still not something that we say, okay, it's clear cut according to the Messiah. All right? <clears throat> All right? It's according to the Messiah. That's just the point I wanted to bring with that. All right, Ty, before we get ready to stop, he says, 
فانه ياجل السنه ويفسق النكاح فاذا كان اجله لمرض فمذهب انه لا فسق له فسخ لها كما سبق so he's going to bring a statement of um, ibn taymiyyah rahimahullah that the wife has a right to go to a judge for the judicial matter and ask for a fasqun all right a fasqun brothers and sisters is different from a talaqun or a khul all right now talaq is something that occurs at the hands of the husband okay uh, that's a divorce khul'un khul'a is also a divorce but it's normally and usually the case that it is sought from the woman as a way of ransom herself from the marriage now a fasqu fasqu this is an annulment or uh, abolishing right or annulling the or, or, or uh, null and void the marriage all right this is not from the husband this is on the request of the wife going to a judge okay or a hakim to decide the matter okay that's what happens so Shigur, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah is saying that if the husband is incapable of filling her desires, all right, he's incapable, he can't fulfill her desires, then she has the right to seek from the judge to null and void or abolish the marriage contract between them. All right, this is what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying. All right, he says, He also goes on to say that if it be the case that he is unable and capable to fulfill her desire, how much more so if he's incapable in terms of fulfilling her nafaqa? Or he says it's more preferable than uh, her seeking or having the right to seek uh, an annulment of the marriage due to him being incapable of spending or providing for her. Sheikh Taymiyyah says what Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah says here is correct. Uh, he says because there are many of the women who wants to live with their husband but they want children from that marriage all right they want children more than what they want from the money okay and he says the money is not her, it's not her concern in regards to these affairs for he says for this reason we are saying uh if he's unable and incapable of providing for her then indeed uh, for in the lahat, for her, she has the right to seek um, from the judge to annul the marriage. But however, if he is um, unable and incapable of fulfilling her desires, then she does not have the right to seek a judicial matter from the judge to seek it. Unless it is confirmed that he has an issue that he it can't be cured. All right. Unless it's confirmed that it's something there that it can't be, it can't be cured. For example. A lot of men suffer, and, and, and it's not something specifically that cause it, as they're trying to find out. It's called ED, or you would call it uh, erectional uh, dysfunction. And a lot of doctors talk about there are multiple reasons that might cause it, and there it happens in a lot of men, okay? And it can be a turn off in the, the, the marriage. It doesn't mean that the man cannot, you know, get an erection, but it's not usually the case is when he was like younger or so forth that he can get an erection and the blood get rolling and circulating like that okay so in this case it's not like okay it's in this case the woman can have or required to have some patient if it's something that they can do that can help out in that case you understand but if he have a disease or a sickness or illness whereas though he cannot fulfill her desires and for some reason he can't do it for example uh and, and all those things then in that case she probably went out of the marriage she has the right to seek out of the marriage okay that's he just said the same thing i'm just saying here meaning if it's a disease or illness that can be cured that can be treated all right then she should be patient all right and you know, in opposition of the condition that she found herself in now, then it's not upon her to go seek an annulment for the marriage. Okay. He says, as far as and we're we'll stopped there, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah ta'ala, because we're we're finished. We'll probably pick back up on the issue of traveling, because that's what he's gonna go into next in terms of when the husband spends a certain amount of time away from his wife, how long that is. This is a thick issue. Is it six months? Can he be away from her for a year? When can she ask for her rights in terms of her being, you know, her fulfillment of, you know, and her rights, being maintained, safety, security, and also having relations. All right. So we're, we're getting to that. Hopefully, alhamdulillah, we was able to learn something in this particular talk. As again, like I said, 
marriage is a responsibility between both parties, okay? And it's not the job of just one, it's the job of both. And it is a job, and it is a business contract, and it is something that requires responsibility and accountability, and it is about patience, and it is about compromising, and it is about understanding. All of those things plays a part. You understand? You're not going to get into a marriage and be one-sided, one-minded, one-tracted, and think that it's going to work. It doesn't happen like that. You're not going to get into a marriage talking about you're not going to correct what you already have wrong. Uh, I've been doing this for so, so many years. I'm going to stay upon this way. It doesn't work that way. Henceforth, you see how detailed the scholars are going into the matter of the night and fulfilling the desires of each other plays. That woman has a right. Can you abandon her? No. Can you sit there and not fulfill her rights? No. These rights are in place so that no one become oppressed. Okay, to keep things harmonized between you two. If a person comes in and, 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 and just disrupted that, then that becomes a problem. Makes it, you know, someone come up and disrupt all of that. Don't give someone their rights. Someone feel as though they're being cheated. Someone feel as though they're being slighted. It becomes a problem. So when we be getting into these marriages that we be getting in, we only touch on the surface of the marriage. You understand? And we don't touch on the whole thing. We don't learn about the ahkam of the marriage. And when we learn about the Akam of the marriage, it's only to use it as a weapon against each other. I only want to bring up the fact that you're falling short in your rights that you're supposed to give me, right? But I don't want to bring up anything else. I'm not a person that's standing there helping you get up for prayer. I'm not even reminding you that the Salat is in. I don't feel no type of way if you don't pray. I'm not reminding you of Allah as a wajal. I don't care if you don't read the book of Allah. I don't care if you don't, you know, study the Sunnah. I don't care if you don't give charity. I don't care if you don't do X, Y, and Z. But I'm worried about the simple fact that the moment you can't give me my right, I want to make a big fuss about it. So I'm going to call Masjid so-and-so. Or I'm going to call student Fulan or Alan. Or I'm going to call this person or call that person to make a whole big ruggers between your marriage because this is this and that. But where was all of that energy when the person was sitting there showing you signs after signs that they were slipping or slagging and you ain't seen nothing about their dean? You understand we have to stop playing these games. You want to get in a real marriage to understand that you're committing yourself to that person and y'all got a responsibility to fulfill and that y'all have to understand that there is a rule and regulation that must be applied. Because the scholars are taking their time out to study the book of Allah to give us the understanding of it. The sooner the Prophet something to give us the understanding of it. It's not a game. And you wonder why the divorce rates are so high because everybody getting into marriage thinking it's a game. Looking at other people's marriages and thinking we need to be the power couple. We need to be that. You don't need to be none of that. What you need to be is fearing slaves of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala. Y'all are together to give each other comfort and help each other to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more. To improve each other. You understand? So the more that that woman start to love Allah, the more that that man start to love Allah, the more they love each other. If you don't understand that point, then you're going you're gonna to forget it. Do you understand? The more that the person loves the laws, the more they're going to love you. Do you understand? And I mean love you properly. I'm not talking about loving you earthly wise. Do you understand? Because that stuff is already relative. What if you no longer look attracted to the guy? What if you no longer get his juices going? What happened then? What if you no longer the person that he thought you was when y'all first got together? What happened then? That's earthly love. It stops. Then, then he, he's looking on to the next bait. He's going to the next thing. Right? But if he loved you and he loved the law and he loved you for a law, he's still going to be obligated to do right because he understand the issue. He's going to love your iman. He's going to love everything else about you. He's going to love your character, your akhlaq. He's going to love your striving, your putting forth. That man that only love you for your flesh, that man that only love you for some earthly things or what you can do for him, that man don't care about your soul or your or things like that. Likewise, the woman don't care about your soul or your nafs if she don't care anything. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us better spouses, to allow us to come into Islam and to practice Islam and to allow us to become better husbands and become better wives and also be responsible enough to practice the marriage. Whatever we said that was incorrect in our translation today, I know I made many flaws and many mistakes. This is a tough, tough subject because, again, I'm not really well versed too much in the luga, uh, the lingo of the fiqh of marriage, okay? And talking about this bab, but alhamdulillah Sheikh with me does a real good job for me to understand some of the issues that's being discussed and I'm able to go over the issues closely close to that. Whatever I said is incorrect or wrong was for myself and the shaitan. Whatever I said is incorrect is from Allah who wa subhanahu alayhi wa sallam. Ashhadu wa la ilaha anta astakutu ilayhi jazakallah khaim as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.